Morning. morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, grab your Bibles if you have them with you and open them once again to Mark chapter 14 this morning. As we continue to follow Jesus along on his journey to the cross uh, this morning and next Sunday we'll be uh, spending time with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with his sleepy disciples. And so this morning we'll look at just, just verses 32 to 42 today. Um, I'd like to start with a question this morning. I think it'll help you kind of process what we're, we're looking at today. Uh, what do you tend to do when you feel yourself growing anxious about something that you know must be done and it can only be done by you? Uh, you can't pass the buck. You can't pass it off to somebody else. This is something that you and only you can do. What do you do? Or are you someone that tends to try to seek distraction? Right, I do that from time to time. Right, We'll try to distract ourselves, do something, take our mind off of what we know must be done. Or are you someone that maybe in a way you try to kind of deny reality? The reality of the situation, you try to kind of... You know, just kind of play it off and kind of fantasy land, and just maybe if we just ignore it, it'll go away. But in reality, you know that that's not the case. Or, or maybe you're you're that that individual that kind of just gives in to the the anxiety. You you give in to the the dread. You're consumed with dread because of what must be done. I think if we're honest, we're probably we've all done all three <laughs> at, at some point or another, right? That, that we've all done all three and some of us are more prone to to be a distractor or a denier or some of us to just skip all those and we're more more of the ones who just dread everything when, when something is coming about we just tend to give ourselves over this but but my, my, my thought as we think about our past this morning what would happen if we chose to do what God's Word tells us to do whenever we begin to grow anxious what would happen all right what, what if we would actually do what God's Word says when we begin to feel this way? What if we chose to pray? Right? What if we would choose to, to pray instead? That's what Jesus did and that's what we're told to do in Philippians 4, right? Verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What shocks me uh, again, in our, as I was preparing this week and, and looking at the life of Jesus and thinking about what was, what was happening in our text, the, the, the mere fact that Jesus felt the need to pray about anything at all tells me that I need to pray about everything. That's right? right? That, that, that Jesus, the perfect Son of God, felt compelled that he needed to spend time with his Father it, it just convicted me of like, uh, is there ever any moment that I'll need to go to my Heavenly Father in prayer? If, if Jesus felt the need to pray about anything ever, we should pray about everything always. Right? Always have this need to go to God in prayer. You see, we know and believe that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. That's the, 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 the core of our faith, right? The core uh, tenet of our, of, our, of our faith. That we know that because He is the Son of God, He knows all things, and yet... When he robed himself in flesh and he dwelt among us, there were some things that he didn't know, that he limited himself in what he could know. That Jesus didn't know the day or the hour of his return. We know that because he said so, that only the Father knew this. But there were times like in our passage this morning, as we'll see, that Jesus had complete knowledge, right? A complete understanding of future events. And guess what it did to him? It, it, it caused him his soul to become exceedingly sorrowful is what our text will tell us. That Jesus was able to see his father forsaking him on the cross as he bore the sins for the world. And you know what it did to him? It crushed him. It crushed him. It crushed him. What he saw compelled him to go to his favorite place to be alone with his father. You see, Jesus didn't just have a prayer closet. Jesus had a prayer garden. Right? A prayer garden. The hour of his betrayal was near, which meant that the time of Jesus to fulfill the purpose of his incarnation was almost here. Before either of those events would happen, Jesus would go to the garden first with his disciples to pray in preparation for what he knew was to come next. I believe we're going to see a side of Jesus that we're not used to seeing in Scripture. As we've been following along in this study through the Gospel of Mark, we'll see an emotional side of Jesus. Three different emotions we'll see in our text. We'll see 
the distress of Jesus, we'll see the disappointment of Jesus, and we'll also see the disgust of Jesus. So that'll be our outline for this morning if you're taking notes. And so let's grab our Bibles now and stand if you're able as we honor the reading of God's Word. Mark 14, verses 32 to 42. It says, Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he says to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John, and, and him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. And he went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words, and when he returned he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be, go be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is God's word. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have made. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for this passage that we have before us this morning. God, as we look at Jesus, uh, and maybe in a way that we haven't looked at before or, or, or see him in a way that we haven't seen in quite a while. And so, Father, we ask that you would teach us your word this morning as we see and are reminded of, of Jesus feeling that he needed to pray to you about what was about to happen to him, it should be a reminder to all of us that we should always have that same need and desire to come to you in prayer. Father, again, thank you for what you're going to do among us this morning. Help us to, to listen this morning and then do what your word tells us to do. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The first emotion that we see in the text is the distress of Jesus. The distress of Jesus. Verses 32 to 36 is where we see this. It says, Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Just to catch us up to where we're at and what's going on, uh, it's now after midnight, the, the start of Good Friday, and Jesus and his disciples have made their way to their destination on the, the Mount of Olives. Uh, they come to, to one of Jesus' favorite places to pray, right? The, the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, here is recorded, uh, you know, he's coming to the garden to pray. And this is just one of uh, several occasions where it's recorded that, that Jesus would go there to pray. And I'm sure there are many more occasions that were not recorded for us in Scripture. Uh, the Mount of Olives was, as its name implies, covered with olive groves. Olive groves, olive gardens, uh, they were everywhere. Uh, there wasn't room in the city to, to, to grow these, and so they would do it on the hillside outside the, the city walls, and this was a, a great source of income for many. The olives would be pressed to create olive oil, and, and in fact, Gethsemane means oil press. Right? That's what that word actually means. But on this night, Jesus would be pressed by the thoughts of the cup that he would be made to drink in a matter of, of hours, that he would be the one under pressure. And so what, what did Jesus do when the pressures of life began to press in on him? We see in the text he prayed, right? He prayed, but he didn't pray alone. He took his disciples with him. There were only 11 of them at this point because Judas had departed, right? If you remember uh, the, the last week in the text and 
uh, after they got done with the Passover meal, and, and the one who would betray him would, would go and, and you know start the ball rolling on that with the chief priests and the scribes. And so it's just 11 of them at this point. And Jesus told eight of them to sit near the possibly the entrance of the, of the garden, and he took the, the inner circle. His says three amigos with him further in, Peter, James, and John. To, and I believe he took them for a particular reason. I think that he had something that he wanted them to see, a, a, a teachable moment, a lesson that they needed to see more so than the other disciples. As leaders, they needed to have a front row seat to what was about to happen. And we know that Jesus intended for all of them to pray from Luke's account, right? And all the, all the, this account is in all four of the Gospels. And, and Luke's uh, account tells us that, that Jesus told them all to pray that they would not enter into temptation. And this is the very thing that Jesus taught them to do in the model prayer. In fact, all of us, right, in the model prayer. In Luke 1, uh, verses 2 through 4, it says this. So Jesus said this. So, so he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation. See, it's right there in the model prayer. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil, the evil one. You see, this night they would all be tempted multiple times and in multiple ways, and they would all give in to that temptation. They would all give in to the temptations that they would face. That Jesus would be tempted multiple times as well, but unlike his disciples, he would not give in to temptation, not one single time. You see, the harder Jesus was pressed, the harder Jesus would pray. The harder Jesus was pressed, the harder Jesus would pray. What about us? Right? The, 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 the more pressure we find ourselves under, the harder we're pressed in our families, the harder we're pressed in our, in our jobs. Right? What, what do we do? What's our response? Do we pray less or do we pray more? I know what we should do. That's right. We should pray more, not less. We know that Jesus was pressed hard because verse 33 tells us that he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And in verse 34, Jesus told Peter, James, and John that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful, even to death, right? That's the, the deepest kind of sorrow, right? Just that he feels like he was about to die. His heart was broken so deeply. He was on the verge of dying of a broken heart as he contemplated what being separated from his father was going to be like as he bore the sins of the world. Jesus was in great distress and he told his inner circle to stay close by and watch over him, to pray for him and to pray for themselves, right? He, he needed them in this moment and they couldn't bear with him. They couldn't do what he asked them to do. Verse 35 tells us that he went a little further and he fell on the ground and began to, to pray. Here we're told why he was so deeply distressed. It wasn't because he dreaded being beaten or scourged with a cast a cat of nine tails, right? That's what we sometimes that's what we think of. We think of uh, he, he, he was concerned about the pain uh, as a fully human man, right? He, he understood that pain was coming, physical pain, agony of the cross, and we talk about that often. But that's not why he was distressed. He wasn't distressed at having nails being driven through his hands and his feet. It wasn't even because he dreaded death, because he knew that was the reason he was born. The reason he left heaven in the first place was to come down and die for the sins of the world. So it couldn't have been that either. I believe what caused Jesus to be deeply distressed was that he dreaded the thought of being forsaken by his father. That's what distressed him so deeply. Never, not even for a second, throughout all of eternity, had God the Son experienced being separated from God the Father. What, what could that even be like for him? He had no concept of this, and it distressed him deeply. He'd never been forsaken by his father. This terrified Jesus. This broke Jesus' heart. And he cried out to his daddy in his agony and in his anguish. That's what he called him. He called him Abba here, right? Abba, Father. That we, Daddy, a term of intimacy from him. Think about this way. Please, Daddy, if it were possible, let this hour pass from me. Please, Daddy, I know that all things are possible for you. Please, Daddy, take this cup away from me. And lastly, he just give in. Daddy, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will be done. Daddy, can, can you see it? Can you hear the prayer crying out? Probably 
tears streaming down his face. Daddy, help me. I appreciate the way that David McKenna described what was happening here. He said Jesus counts upon communion with God and fellowship with his friends to sustain him until the moment of his betrayal. He does not expect his friends to continue with him beyond that point. But his father is different. Surely he will stay beside him through an ordeal which no man had ever suffered before and no, and no one will ever suffer again. See, Jesus was distressed by what lay ahead of him on the cross. And yet he did not let his distress cause him to become disobedient to his father's will. Right? He was distressed, but he didn't let that cause him to become disobedient, right? How often do we become distressed by what God wants us to do? Right? We know. We know, we know what God wants us to do. He's burdened our hearts to do a certain thing, to, to break off a relationship or, or to maybe leave a position at work or whatever it is. We, we know what he wants us to do and it causes us to be distressed. How many times... Has our distress caused us to be disobedient to God's will? Because you see, if we don't do what God tells us to do, we're being disobedient. Whether we're distressed or not, we're being disobedient to what God wants us to do, and that never works out well. God knew how possibly, how impossibly difficult and excruciatingly painful this would be for his son. And likewise, God knows how difficult and how painful some of the things that he tells us to do. In his word are as well, right? He knows that. He knows that following Jesus isn't easy. He knows it's hard. He knows there's troubles, there's trials, there's tribulations that we will be hated for his name's sake. He knows all these things. And what does he want us to do? He wants us to trust him. That's right. Trust him, depend on him, pray harder, press into him deeper. That's why we must do the same thing that Jesus did when he was distressed. We need to pray. That's why we must do what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to do. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. See, Jesus trusted His Father with all of His heart. Do you? Do you? Jesus didn't lean on His own understanding. Again, I ask you, do you do that? Jesus, didn't, Jesus acknowledged his Father in all of his ways. Do we do that? Not some of our ways, not just on Sunday mornings, but all the time in all of our ways do we acknowledge him. You see, the path, the path that his Father directed for him was to the cross where he would suffer and die for the sins and experience the agony of separation that sin always brings. You see, church, Jesus was distressed, but he was not deterred. He was distressed, but he was not deterred, not one bit. The second emotion that we see in the text is the disappointment of Jesus. Verses 37 to 40. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. I hope these four verses bother you as much as they bothered me this week, because they should. I also hope that these four verses encourage you as much as they've encouraged me this week. So you may be thinking... <laughs> How can this both bother and encourage? And you may be asking, how, wh why should these verses bother us at all? I believe it should bother us deeply that we can disappoint Jesus. Right? It should bother us deeply that we can disappoint Jesus, not just by what we do, but also by what we fail to do. Why we also often think of sin as things that we do. Right? We commit the sin of fill in the blank. We, we lie, we steal, we fornicate, we whatever. Gossip, fill in the blank. Those are the things that we actively do, but we, we forget there's a whole other side of sin that we commit. 
When we fail to do what God tells us to do. Sins of omission. We leave those out. Right? Jesus told them to wait. Right? To wait and watch. And we know from Luke's account to pray. Right? And what did they do? They didn't do that. They went to sleep. Right? What a disappointment. See, if you don't think it was disappointing to Jesus that Peter, James, and John could not stay awake and watch and pray for one hour, I believe you're greatly mistaken. I believe you're greatly mistaken. Yes, Jesus brought them uh, with him to, to, to teach them a lesson, but he also brought them there so they could support him with their prayers. Not only were they to pray for themselves, they were there to pray for him so that they would not enter into temptation, but also that he would not enter into temptation. See, Jesus is fully God, and that means he cannot sin. But there's something else about Jesus that makes him special as well. You see, Jesus is also fully man. He's fully man. He's fully human. He could be tempted to sin. It was for that reason that the devil tried in vain to tempt him after his baptism. The <coughs> Hebrews 4.15 tells us that Jesus was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That Jesus was struggling alone because his prayer partners were sleeping. Think about that. Jesus was struggling alone because his prayer partners were sleeping. How often, how often do we abandon people that are asking us to pray? Send out prayer requests and then you know, we'll get a, a thumbs up or I'm praying or whatever. But how many times do we, we, we do that but we never pray? We act like the emoji is the response that we prayed or we never actually physically stopped and prayed. And that person asked you to pray now. Need your help now. And you left them alone in their struggles because you didn't pray. That's right. The same thing happens. Same thing is happening here. He was struggling alone because his prayer partners were sleeping. Not just once or twice, but three times he would find them sleeping. First time he caught them sleeping, he confronted Peter because he's the leader. Right? Big shot, Peter. You want to be the man? You want to, you want to be the boss? You want to head up the crew? Then I'm going to hold you accountable. He come to him. He come to Peter first. But if you notice, he didn't call him Peter. He called him Simon. That's never good. <laughs> That's never good. Whenever Jesus calls you by your old name, that's never a good sign. Jesus called him by his old name because he was behaving like his old self. He didn't call him Peter. He called him Simon. Hadn't Jesus just told him that he would deny him three times that very night? He just told him this. It was, still had to be fresh in his mind. If anyone should have been committed to prayer that night, guess who it should have been? Peter. Peter should have been the, the greatest prayer warrior of that night. But he didn't. And neither did James and John. They all stumbled, just like Jesus said they would. It's already beginning, right? They're already beginning to stumble, just like Jesus said they would. But then again, maybe we're being too hard on them. Perhaps they began to pray and fell asleep. Anybody here do, anybody here do that besides me? I start off praying, and next thing I know, it's, my alarm's going off. <laughs> right? Maybe that's what happened. Maybe they did begin to pray. We don't, we don't know. And they fell asleep in the midst of their prayers. They're, think about it. Their bellies were full from the Passover meal. And again, this was this was a feast. So they're, they're, they're full of food. They're full of wine. Right? Uh, all these things are there. Uh, they were mentally and emotionally exhausted by the revelation that one of them would betray Jesus and all, all of them would be made to stumble. Peter would, be, would deny him. Not to mention all this was happening between midnight and three in the morning. All right? This isn't this isn't prime wide awake time. This this is when people should be sleeping, which is the exact reason that Jesus told them to pray. <laughs> he knew they were tired. He knew their bellies were full. He knew that they're they're they they were emotionally spent. He knew they were weak. And so what did he tell them to do? Watch and pray that you not enter into temptation. You need to be praying. You're not going to be able to stay awake if you don't pray. And they found this out. He told them to do all these things. 
This had to be a big disappointment to Jesus. How many times and in how many ways have we disappointed Jesus? Right? How many times and in how many ways have we disappointed Jesus? Like Peter, James, and John, we didn't plan on giving in to temptation. Right? This wasn't premeditated. They didn't plan on doing this, but they did. Right? We planned on reading our Bibles more, but we didn't. We said we were going to share the gospel with our neighbors, but we haven't. We may have even planned on praying every night before we go to sleep, and the same thing happened to Peter, James, and John. It happened to us too. We fall asleep. We fall asleep. And so, so why does this happen so often, right? That's the, the, that's the million dollar question. Why does this keep happening to us? We don't plan to fail. We, we don't plan to be disobedient. We, we want to do what God wants us to do. Look, Jesus gave us the answer at the end of verse 38. When he told Peter that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We all have good intentions, don't we? God, I hope so. I hope we still have to be faithful. I hope that we want to be more obedient. We want to be more committed. But something seems to always happen. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. If you repented of your sins and believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are now a new creation. That's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's a true statement, but, but there's, a, there's a problem. If you want to call it that, I think it's a problem. It's a problem for me. We're new creations positionally before God, but we're still in the process of being made new creations practically. God sees us as new and perfect and without sin. That's, that, that's who we are before him positionally, but we're all still busted up. We're all still broken, and we all still struggle, all of us, in various degrees. Every single one of us. We're all somewhere in the midst of this process known as sanctification. We have the Spirit of God dwelling within us, and we're told to walk in the Spirit, and yet we still struggle to do the very thing that God's Word tells us to do. Why is that? Right? Why is that? Because our flesh is weak. Because our flesh is weak. John MacArthur would answer that question this way. He says, because willing spirits are still attached to unredeemed flesh. Believers are not always able to practice the righteousness they want to do. I believe the Apostle Paul would say amen to John MacArthur there. The Apostle Paul confessed his own struggle with the weakness of his unredeemed flesh in Romans 7. He, he called his flesh, he called his physical body a body of death. In Romans 7, 18 and 19 says this, he says, For I know that in me, that in that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Anybody else? Anybody else say the, the things I want to do, I want to read my Bible more, I want to pray more, I want to be... Uh, more evangelistic, I want to be more gracious and kind, and all these things, I want to do these things, but then I want I'm not doing them, and not even that, I want I'm doing the exact opposite. I want to doing the things that I don't want to do. It's that flesh, it's that corrupt flesh, that sinful nature still has its claws dug into us. But one day, new body, new heaven, new earth, Glorified by his no more struggle with this wretched flesh. You're probably sitting there saying, well, Brother Mike, get to the encouragement part. Where's, how are these verses encouraging to us, or how should they be? As, that, as odd as this may sound, it should encourage us to know that Jesus understands why we at times disappoint him with what we do or fail to do. Right? He understands. He knows. He knows. Jesus knows when our spirit is willing and our flesh is weak. He knows this. More than that, we can be encouraged because we know that Jesus was, will never stop loving us, even though we disappoint him again and again and again. And you say, I don't know, Brother Mike, that's, 
that, that's a reach. I'm not sure if I can, I can agree with you on that. And I, and I would just point you to Peter. Peter. <laughs> How Jesus dealt with Peter is a great example. He didn't stop loving Peter. He didn't stop using Peter. Right? And Jesus had to keep on restoring him that Peter would disappoint Jesus over and over again. Peter is all the proof that we need that this is true. You see, it was bad enough that Jesus was disappointed with his disciples, but it would be even worse when his disappointment turned into disgust. It's the last thing that we see, the last emotion that we notice in our text is the disgust of Jesus. Verses 41 and 42. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The first time Jesus found his disciples sleeping instead of watching and praying, I believe he became frustrated with them. And rightly so. Amen? Rightly so. The second time Jesus found his disciples sleeping, instead of watching and praying, his frustration turned into disappointment. And again, we can understand that. Now, after the third time Jesus came and found his disciples sleeping and resting, instead of watching and praying, Jesus' disappointment turned into utter disgust. He said, well, Brother Mike, where do you, where do you draw that from? How, how, do you, how do you determine that? We know because verse 41 tells us that he shouted, it is enough. Right? You ever had that moment where it, maybe you were the one that somebody yelled at or you yelled it out because you've had, you had it. Enough! Kids are arguing and fighting about who's going to play the game next. You intervene and you shout, enough! Enough of this! Done! Over! No more! That's, that's, how, that's how I envision this moment happening. Enough. He was fed up. One time, two times, three times, enough. Enough of this. He's disgusted with what's happening. With his, his, his disciples and the betrayal, all of it. I think we're badly mistaken when we only think of Jesus as being meek and mild. Sweet Jesus, right? Just, just, just chill Jesus. Nothing ever bothers Jesus. He never gets frustrated or mad or just, just everything's great like his own uh, you know, muscle relaxers or something. Like he just kind of, nothing bothers him at all. What, Prozac, is that it? Is that what it is? Is that, that the one that makes him kind of like loopy? Whatever it is, Prozac Jesus. That's, that's wrong. No way. We're badly mistaken. We think nothing ever bothered Jesus and he was always calm, cool, and collected. We know of at least two other times that he became disgusted with the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. Remember that? We just talked about one a few weeks ago. How do we know he was disgusted? He made a whip out of cords, kicked over tables, dumped over money changer jars and stuff like that. He, he lost it. Because he was disgusted with what was happening. He was disgusted at what he saw then and, and when he made a, a whip of cords and drove everyone out of the temple courtyards. And, and, so, and so why was he so disgusted then? Because they had turned his father's house into a den of robbers. Right? That's what they, and that disgusted him. He couldn't stand it. So why why was he so disgusted this time? What what was it? I believe there were a couple of reasons for his disgust. Firstly, he was disgusted because of the indifference or lack of concern of his inner circle for his open display of anguish and agony. Right? They could see this. Right? They were there. They could see him in agony. Right? And they'd never seen Jesus like this before. They'd never seen him this way, and yet that still was not enough to compel them to stay awake and to pray and to watch and to have concern for Jesus. They could see it in his body and they could hear it in his voice as he prayed. And in fact, look, look at what Luke 22, 44 says. It says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You think that he didn't need some help? You think that they could? They didn't know what was happening with him? They couldn't hear what was happening with him? Right? He was basically pleading with them to stay awake, watch, and pray, and yet they still couldn't do it. After experiencing the same thing three times in a row, Jesus had enough. I think sometimes we're too quick to play the grace card and try to 
dismiss the fact that Jesus is likely disgusted with our ongoing pattern of, pattern of sinfulness. Right? God is gracious. We know that Jesus, there is grace for our sins. But sometimes we're just too quick. That's it. We just, we just continue in our sin and we just lay down the grace card. It's covered. It's covered. I, I, get, I, I, I know this is sinful and this is wrong, but grace card. Diplomatic immunity. Right? It doesn't work like that. There's grace. There's grace for our sinfulness. Absolutely. Praise God for that. But there's also an expectation of repentance. Right? There's also an expectation of repentance. Jesus expected the disciples to repent of their indifference and to watch and pray with him so that they would not enter in temptation. But they never did. They never did. The second reason that for Jesus to discuss this in that moment was the reality that the time of his betrayal was at hand. A, a, a perfect storm. Sleeping disciples and a betraying disciple. All of it's coming together, and he was disgusted by all of it. Jesus had given Judas multiple opportunities to repent and place his faith in him. Now Judas is leading a mob directly to Jesus to arrest him like a common criminal. The act of betrayal in itself was repulsive, but to be betrayed by a friend or a loved one is absolutely disgusting. Amen? You have to know that. Right? If you've experienced, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What better word could you use than disgust? No doubt that Jesus could see them coming from miles away, literally. Again, they're up on the side of the mountain looking down at the city. It's, it's, the, it's the darkest part of the night, and here comes this, this procession of torches. Right? He sees them coming. When Jesus told the disciples to rise and let us be going, he wasn't telling them it was time to go and hide. He was telling them it was time for them to go and fulfill the scriptures. It was time for them to be made to stumble for his name's sake. It was time for the shepherd to be struck and for the sheep to be scattered. It was time for the Son of Man to be betrayed into the hand of sinners. And this disgusted Jesus. Even though Jesus was distressed, disappointed, and disgusted by everything that took place that night in the garden, none of those emotions deterred him from being obedient to the will of his Father. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful for that? So this morning as we close our time together, you're probably thinking to yourself that you kept saying something about a lesson for Peter, James, and John. What was this lesson that they needed to learn? They need to learn the importance of putting on the whole armor of God. Right? The whole armor of God. They need to learn that they, they need to always be prepared for spiritual warfare because spiritual warfare never stops for a child of God. It never stops. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12 tells us, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Again, John MacArthur described what the disciples needed to learn in the garden this way. He said the disciples needed to learn that spiritual victory goes to those who are alert in prayer and who depend on God, and that self-confidence and spiritual unpreparedness leads to spiritual disaster. Disaster. That's what was happening tonight, that night in the garden for them. And we know that Peter was a slow learner because we know that he still denied Jesus three times after falling asleep three times in the garden. But we also know that Peter finally learned the lesson, didn't he? We have the rest of Scripture to, to see that. He finally learned this lesson, but he had to learn it the hard way, just like most of us, don't we? That's right. right? We, we know what to do, and sometimes we don't learn it. We have to learn it the hard way. Over the years, he'd experienced both the subtle and severe attacks of the enemy. And he hoped to teach other believers the same lesson that Jesus taught him in the garden. Right? 
to keep watch, to be vigilant, to stay prayed up, and to always be ready. This same Peter that couldn't stay awake one hour to pray with Jesus wrote the, this warning to the church years later in his first epistle. 1 Peter 5 8. He says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Brothers and sisters, we need to learn this same lesson today. We need to learn this same lesson today. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We too must remain vigilant and prayed up because our adversary, the devil, is still walking about like a roaring lion, and he's still seeking whom he may devour. The disciples' lesson in the garden is still our lesson for today. Their lesson is our lesson for today. I know there might be some here with us today, and, and you've heard all this, and it's kind of a little bit to take in, a little, a little too much, maybe passing right over your head. I don't want you to be overly concerned with what happened in this text. You have bigger issues. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you have bigger issues than this. Right? You don't, don't concern yourself with committing to prayer or any of those things. Right? You have bigger fish to fry, as the saying goes. You need to repent of your sins. You need to place your faith in Jesus. That's what you need to do. That's, that's where you, your journey begins. That, that's where it starts. And so this, this cross that we keep talking about, and, and Jesus dying on the cross, and, and, and the blood, and the resurrection, all these things, that, that's all, that was all done for you. All right, it was God's will for him to do these things, but he did this so that we might be saved. All of us might be saved. But the only way it works is if we repent of our sins and believe in Jesus. On Sunday school this morning, Naaman had this rash, had this leprosy, had this skin disease, and, 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 he, and he came to the, the prophet, right, Elisha, and he said, that, that, you know, how can I be healed? How can I be made clean? And there was only one way for that to happen. He had to go and, and, and get it, dip himself in the Jordan seven times. And he kind of was taken aback. He said, that's, that's, I, I, you know, I've been washing. I've been washing. I've got, I got a place to wash back where I, in my house. i got a nice tub and everything. And I've already tried that. That don't work. You see, this is God's way for him to be clean. Right? He, he couldn't do it his own way. He had to do it God's way. And it's the same way. There's only one way for you to be saved. One way. And that's God's way. And God's way is through repentance, turn from your sins, confess your sins to God, and place your faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the only way. And so whatever God's dealing with you about this morning, right? maybe you've been struggling with sin, maybe you've been struggling with being faithful to God. And, and again, this is a reminder. We understand that, that the, the flesh, uh, the spirit is willing in all of us, but the flesh is weak. And so what do we do? How, what, what, what should that drive us to do? Pray. Pray. Depend on God. So if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus, your Lord and Savior, that's where it needs to start for you. So let me encourage you to do that this morning. However God has spoken to you this morning through your word, let us respond to him in the way that he wants us to respond. Amen? Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. God in heaven, we do thank you so much for this day uh, that you have given to us. Father, we thank you for your word to us. As we look at what we would call a, a story, a, a Bible story, and a, an account from your word. And as we look at Jesus, and we look at him and, and how he agonized uh, over uh, what lay before him, uh, the cross and, and all the things that went along with that, we, we are so often quick to think of his physical suffering because we can identify with that. The, the physical pain of, uh, of what it would be like to have these, these large spikes driven through his hands and his feet and the, the, the crown of thorns and being whipped and all those things. But God, that wasn't, that wasn't what distressed him. It was the, the fact that he was going to experience separation from you, something he had never experienced before, that he would, he would experience being forsaken by you, something he certainly had never experienced before. And God, we were reminded this morning that he went through all of these things, that he was distressed as he was, and he, and he suffered as he did, not, not because of
anything that he had done, but he did it for us. He did it because he loved us and because he loved you, because he wanted to be obedient to your will for him. And your will for him was to die for us. And so, God, we thank you for that. We thank you so much for that. And, God, that this morning as we, we were reminded of, of our own limitations, even as your sons and your daughters, as, as believers, that we, we're, we're, we're not perfect yet. And that we struggle and we stumble just like the disciples did. That's why we must pray. Father, help us to pray. Help us to be faithful to pray. Help us to be more dependent upon you for not just the big things, but all things. All things. And so, Father, help us to do that. Help us to be everything that you want us to be. Help us to be faithful to you. God, we ask that you be with any that might be among us today that have not yet believed in Jesus, that have not been saved, or who have not been born again. God, I pray that you would do a work in them, stir their hearts up, let them step out today and say, Today, I'm done. I'm done running from, from Jesus. I'm, I'm done trying to do things my own way. Today, I want to follow Jesus. God, we ask that you would stir their hearts up. Give them the courage to step out and profess their faith. Help them to turn away from their sins that, that, that has condemned them before you. God, whatever, whatever it is you would have us to do, help us to be obedient. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.